Amelia. Welcome to the 12th house. We are breaking the fourth wall ish in a sense. <laughs> I'm like coming out from behind the curtain onto the pod. It's more of a Wizard of Oz situation. <laughs> right. Yes, that is apt. Yeah. <laughs> For those who don't know, Amelia runs Softer Sand Studios, who edits our wonderful two podcasts. Hopefully they're wonderful. <laughs> yes. And I'm afraid of saying your last name wrong. It's so cool. Can you say it? Yes, uh, I can say it. And it's also you can't really say it wrong because everyone in my family says it differently. So Love that. I say Amelia Ruby, like roll it together. That's more that. Czech, which is where it's from. But my family has a whole trivia team called the Silent H because they just say Ruby and they tell everyone that the H is silent. Wow. Are you guys split down the middle? Like is half the family like it's all about the... Uh, yeah, no, it's just me. Like the rest of my family is very like Midwestern and Nebraskans and don't care. And then I'm like, you know, the grandchild who studied abroad in Prague and like figured it out <laughs> and brought it back. And everyone's like, why yeah. are you bothering? We don't care. <laughs> I appreciate their lore, though, like that they're creating lore that no, the H is silent. Like we've just decided that's how it is. Oh, now. yeah. My family's really good at the power of a narrative. <laughs> They can tell you how it is. That's for sure. So you come by it naturally yeah. because as an editor, you have to kind of create something out of nothing a lot of the time. Or you have to knit together a beautiful sweater out of like a pile of tangled yarn. Yeah. Or just like find the gorgeous statue inside the block of already beautiful marble. You know, I want to give all my podcasters tons of credit, including you two. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speaking of narrative genius, which you are, we are here to talk about one of your main, I would say, narratives or through lines in a lot of the work that you do, which is how to grow your business without social media. Hot topic. I want to be like, burr, 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 burr. <laughs> Wait, we all spend too much psychic time together. Yes. We're in each other's ears a little too much, but no, but I like it. <laughs> I like think and sound bites now. And I, I yeah. try and figure out how to articulate that to people that don't get it and it doesn't work. They never will. I, I like regularly am listening to like a live workshop and in my head I'm like, pause, highlight, clip. Like, let's give that. <laughs> um, like I'm, so I'm editing it as someone saying it to my face these days. It's impossible. Uh, so true, Bessie. So true. <laughs> so Amelia, tell us how this came to be. Have you always been a social media? Mm, like what I truther truther <laughs> yeah, truther <laughs> no I have not so for folks who are new to me or who I am new to you I used to be very on Instagram mm. <laughs> and it started like everybody else started right like I got on Instagram at least of my of all how millennials got on Instagram like you got on probably in college or right after college you hung out, you posted pictures for your friends, you posted pictures to like signal the cool stuff you were doing. <laughs> you layered the Valencia filter over the, uh, you know, whatever, oh, black yeah. and white filter. Yeah. You're like, am I a photographer now? What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, I'm sorry. This flat yeah, line? <laughs> oh, coffee shop culture? I did it. Yeah. That was 100% me. Like, that's all I did. And then... Like many of us, I started to share like some con like more writing and my captions got longer and I started to make some content and it was casual at first. And then it, you know, just became more and more involved. And I was like basically writing blog posts on my Instagram captions and growing my following. Wow. And I really tried to like make a go at it as a micro influencer. And that in some ways was really successful. Like I did some brand partnerships and eventually I launched a podcast. I got a book deal. I launched a book. And I grew my following to just under 3,000 followers. So very micro in the scheme of things, but all organic. There was no paid ads or anything I was doing to grow that. And it was just through my community and talking about the things I wanted to talk about, which at the time were I really kind of had two big content pillars. One was like selfies for self-love and one was feminist mantras and affirmations and kind of feminist education. Because at the time I was doing my PhD in philosophy and feminist theory. So I was trying to bring that to a very different audience than I had in academia. And then also like posting pictures in my underwear and talking about selfies as a radical practice. 
so, so yeah, I was very online for quite a while. Yeah. I remember that's how I think I first found you was through the selfies for self love. And I was like, this is a really wonderful take on, I felt like, especially at the time, what was such a beginning, the rise of this backlash towards, let's just say influencers as a broader term and like selfie culture from boomers in a way, kind of looking at millennials being like, what's wrong with them and their selfies. It was such a refreshing take. And I think with your lens of having the feminist perspective just naturally woven into that, it was a really refreshing take. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. And I really like I talked about different theories of the gaze and like the male gaze, the female gaze, the oppositional gaze. And I used to teach a little course and we had had practice groups around it. Like it was it was really fun. And I was definitely, you know, kind of following those models we see out there of like, you got something to say, you start sharing it, you build content, you build courses, you have sell those things to a small audience and you work on that organic growth and you you see where it goes. And then, you know, sometimes you do get like the book deal and the stuff that you're kind of promised will will come from that, which then leads to where I started to get super disillusioned with social media and started to step away from the platforms for a lot of reasons, I guess. I have like a couple of things in my head of first, I just want to ask for you as someone who's you have a literally you're a doctor, you have a PhD. Sometimes we like lament, I think, on social media, the fact that we have to sort of take these nuanced topics of conversation and sort of like beat them into submission to be something that's like bite sized and understandable and swipeable and shareable. And I'm curious if that was that journey for you? Was it interesting? Was it helpful in sort of like figuring out your position and where you stood and how to teach people? Or did you find that you're like, actually, like, this is not getting, this is not doing anyone a service. Like, I'm I'm curious about that, because obviously, you ended up writing a book. Yeah, kind of a splat of a question. But what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that because at the time I was in grad school. I was writing my dissertation. I was teaching classes, taking seminars. I like lived in this extremely academic world, like going on Instagram and speaking a totally different language. It felt like was really refreshing. Mm. And also, I will just say, I never underestimate my community or my audience or my followers at the time. I think a lot of those arguments get made and I hear them too around like, there's no nuance on the internet and like people don't want to, don't care. And I think that's true in a lot of spaces, but I also think people underestimate, like, especially in a small platform, you can really curate who you're for and who you're talking mm-hmm. to and you attract the right people and bring them to you. And then like, I was able to have super nuanced conversations with my nice. community on Instagram. And I know that's not everyone's experience. And I think as you grow, that really changes. Like you get a lot more of that sort of reactionary response and perhaps feel the pressure even more to really dilute what you're saying. I don't think that was my experience. I just loved being able to bring kind of things out of, to use a different metaphor, like, you know, the ivory tower Mm -hmm. of academia and try to like share it with people who I really saw grappling with these big questions in their lives. Like, you know, with the selfies project, it was like, how do I like the way I look as I am? Like, I think that what's been interesting is, you know, people were starting there because we've had all these great narratives around body positivity or body neutrality or um, body liberation. But then it's like, but how do I actually do this? Like, you can hit me over the head and tell me I'm supposed to like myself now. But like, that doesn't actually give you the tools to like yourself. And I think that what I loved in a lot of the feminist readings and practices I was engaging in is like, I'm like, there are tools here. We just need to share them and we need to figure them out together. And I never felt like I had to dilute that to share it on social media, at least at like the level I was at. Although my, again, caveat will be as you grow, it changes. And I think a lot of people feel that, right? Like there's like kind of these moments where like, even for me, like you kind of cross like 2,500 people and you're like, I don't know who I'm talking to anymore. You cross 10K and you're like, I'm maybe, you know, three people here and you cross a hundred K and you're like, Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <It's around." laughs> it's almost like the bigger you get, the more you're just like, Oh, I'm not talking to anyone. At least in my experience, like a, mm-hmm. on email, I used to be so much more afraid. And this is part of also just having experience, right? I would be so scared to send an email to a hundred people. Cause I'm like, I know these people, like I know who's reading this and I can like open it up and see who's reading it. And I want to barf. That's 
horrifying. And now I don't even think about it when I send an email, except sometimes when I see the number of like, this is getting sent to whatever, 73,000 people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, (laughs) that's crazy. (laughs) Anyway, let me go on with the rest of my day. I just don't even, I don't even think about other people on the end of it a lot of the time. Yeah. You're doing something really different when you're speaking to a small audience than when you're speaking to a large audience, even if like you're just doing the same thing. I think that's what's hard for people. Like you're just sitting down and writing the email. You probably have a very similar process to how you did it when it was a hundred people, but it means something really different to you and to the people who are receiving it. And everybody's expectations have really shifted. Mm -hmm. Like I think that was part of what I noticed too and what I've seen now for for clients and other folks I work with who have different sizes of audiences where, you know, if you've got 100 people on your mailing list, you're really hoping like 60 or 70 or 80 of them open right. it. Yeah. If you've got 100,000 people on your mailing list, you're like, oh my God, 30% open rate killed right. it. Like yeah. it's, it's just a totally... The scale is different. The scope is different. And that's a lot, I'll just say, like to hold in our bodies and our lived experience of writing an email to have to hold all of that when you sit down to write. It's really challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you practice, I mean, I'm sure you felt this way, especially as you were saying, like my captions were getting longer, like your content was evolving. You were evolving as a creator, like you change and your audience changes. It's tough to say, like, well, where does that like, where does that change in perspective exactly come from? It's kind of an amalgamation of everything. Yeah, you can't locate it in one place. But what I do think is kind of a common theme I see shifting now is just so much discontent in the space between I'm here making content and my follower, subscriber, listener, whoever is like so far away from me, I can't even see them because of how social media platforms have reshaped the space in between us. Like mm-hmm. neither one of us has moved, but we like can't see each other because I think it's totally. just gotten so opaque and cloudy and and people are just really frustrated. I mean, the sentiment has shifted from all of us are on Instagram and we love it or even all of us are on TikTok and we love it to like, do we like it? Do we want to be here? What is happening? I'm so online, but why am I ever online? <laughs> is what I hear a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And you feel, I feel like as social media platforms start, you feel as the user, oh, I'm taken into account here as the priority. And then as usually these venture backed social platforms grow, you're like, oh, wait, 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 it's ad dollars. So I need to get out of the way and whatever product is, you know, pushing the ad dollars, that's what's going to be prioritized over, you know, the user experience. And you just feel it so quickly. And with people whose livelihoods have been dependent on these platforms, like so many of us and so many people we know, you just feel resentful, but then you're also caught in the loop also if you don't own part of your IP because of the platform or your community. I was thinking about this a lot while I was working on the episode of Good For You that you did with Kate from embedded yeah. Yeah. In letter. Mm-hmm. And something that she talks about in that episode, everyone should go listen to it, um, <laughs> is just that she really lays out the ways that, and you were all talking about TikTok, I'm more familiar with Instagram, but I think it's true both places, that like, we get sold this promise of virality, we get sold a promise of easy, huge audience growth. That's like mm-hmm. the promise that they're selling us when we're in these when we're making content for these spaces. And as a result, money, it's like, we're going to give you this big audience to be so like, you're just going to get it, it's going to magically appear, and then you're gonna be able to make a lot of money off of that yeah. or from the platform itself. And then we all start like working toward that and they like sprinkle in enough of that, like, oh, you went viral and you went viral. And like at this stage, I mean, I have a ton of friends making content on TikTok and it's like all of them have had like the one viral moment. Like Mm -hmm. I think TikTok, of course, has like figured out like here's how after you make this many posts, we'll give you this one viral. So you really get hooked and then you make. That's exactly how the algorithm works. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's an algorithm now. It's a formula. It's what they're doing to hook us. And I. What I liked that Kate really pointed out in that conversation on Good For You is that when you're in on social media, you're just chasing that. And as soon as you figure it out, it is in the platform's interest to change the game. So Mm -hmm. you keep chasing Mm -hmm. like you. They can't let you rest on your laurels and have it figured out and know how it works. Like that's not in their interest as people who want to make money and need more of your time on the platform. And I think as business owners. So most of the time when I'm talking about leaving social, I'm talking to small business owners, like 
what's really dangerous about that is we build a lot of skills in making content for a platform, but then like, they, it just changes all the time. And it's so different. Like there's so many ways you can build skills in your business that like you get to have those skills forever and they get to apply in all these scenarios. Like if you get really good at doing sales calls, it doesn't matter whether they're on the phone or they're on zoom. Like it doesn't, it's not platform specific. Like you can just skill build and then use that to grow your business kind of in perpetuity. And I just worry that I do see a lot of people I love and adore running really cool businesses, but like the skill they're building is just chasing the algorithm. And I don't know that that's the skill that's going to benefit their business long term. I, I worry a lot for my people. That is such so well a good take, I think, because mm-hmm. it's almost like um you're reverse engineering. Like, okay, I think that having the ability to create content is like a recession proof skill, I'll say it forever mm-hmm. and ever and ever to make things right, to find a narrative, to understand a customer, to be able to talk to someone, to talk to anyone. But a lot of people are sort of reverse engineering that experience and making content specifically for a platform. And they don't really understand maybe the mechanics of like, well, what is so wonderful about what I just made? Why did it resonate with someone? And it doesn't mean that they, they're not capable of it. Just you're moving so fast to keep up, to run your business mm-hmm. on these platforms that maybe you don't have the, just the, the, the space to like really understand and metabolize what you're doing, why it's working, and then continue to improve your skills over time. Yeah. And sometimes you're developing skills you actually have absolutely no interest in utilizing, like yeah. video editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. 100%. Like it's really cool if you get, if you're on TikTok and you become an amazing video editor and you pivot that into a video editing business, like that is a brilliant strategy. Do it. But like most of the people I know on TikTok have no interest in ever editing a video outside of that oh, platform. Right? right. So we kind of skill build in places that don't follow our like desires and passions and joys. Um, and I think that that is also just dangerous as people with limited time and energy and capacity in the world. I think about that all the time with YouTube where, and like YouTube fashion influencers oh, yeah. or vloggers where I'm like, cause I, if I try to make a YouTube video, I'm, I'm so bored. I can't, I can't edit it. I have to do it in one take. Cause like, I'm just, it's not, it's not going to happen. And I'm just so, so impressed with the fact that they figured out, I don't know, all these editing, all the editing software, like that's incredible. But then to your point, that's not like what they love to do. And of course they're getting burnt out because they have to put up a video every day. Yeah. And it's so much time Mm -hmm. and energy. I was thinking about the behavioral psychologists that these platforms hire to help figure out the algorithms and and keep up with that. And I'm like, how, how do you sleep at night? How? (laughs) How? (laughs) (laughs) But I am someone admittedly chronically off social media. I really struggle to be on there on a personal level. I don't find a lot of joy in it. And then I have an on again, off again relationship with it. But I would like to sometimes have a, let's say, healthier relationship versus hot and cold. But one of the things that I feel like I hear people say a lot is, well, what is marketing without social media? Social media is just intertwined with marketing. So if what is marketing without social media today? And how do you really define that as I feel like that's such a sticky kind of category. Right. And yeah, how did you make that jump? Because I think we we left off on the story of like, you got disillusioned and then we had a little ellipsis. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will. I'll share. I'll tell this. I'll finish the story and then I'll dive into yeah. everything that marketing is without social media. So, so I got a book deal in a slightly magical way. I had run a podcast that I had done Kickstarters for and crowdfunded. I'd raised like $13,000 to launch this road trip podcast I was running called 50 Feminist States. And Um, a couple years after I did that, or maybe a year or two after I did that, I got this email out of the blue from an editor at a publishing company who had been tasked to like go find podcasters they could do books with. And this editor had found my Kickstarter, had found my website, had realized that I'd already self published a book and was like, okay, this is low hanging fruit. We can just like, let's just redo your book. So that's how I got a book deal. So I got a book deal with a much smaller following than many people do. Like Mm -hmm. often when people query for books and agents, they'll be like, you only have 10,000 followers. You only have 20,000 followers. Like we're not interested until you Mm -hmm. grow your platform. And as a result, during the book process, I really got pushed to have more followers. And I really, I went all in. I mean, I spent most of my advance 
getting a new website, paying a social media strategist, getting new photos, like really investing in my platform to try to make my book successful because that's Mm -hmm. the other like secret no one talks about in publishing anymore is like your publishers, they pay you to write the book. Sure. With your advance, but they don't put a lot of money or they have no behind. Yeah. Yeah. You really get very little support unless you're, you know, a New York times bestseller at a huge top five publisher, top big three publisher. So I did all of that. (laughs) And then I like worked really hard and I was looking around a year later and I was like, what did I get out of this? I was like, well, I got about like a hundred followers a month and my book sold 3000 copies, which is nice, but like never going to make any royalties off of that. And I was just kind of sitting there in the ruins of that. And I was like, I got sold this big fat lie, Mm -hmm. frankly, like, and I bought in and I bought in so hard And I really did the work. Like, I'm not over here being like, oh, I'm I'm wise. I was never on social media. Like, no, (laughs) I bought in and I tried my hardest and I really had to come to terms with like, this is not going to happen here for me. I'm not going to be an influencer. I'm not going to sell my like content in this way at this scale. So I decided to leave social media. And in that process, I did what I do best, which is I made some more content. (laughs) (laughs) And what I made was a list of a hundred ways to share your work without social media. Mm -hmm. And that piece of content has really traveled all over the internet. It's been viewed thousands of times. It's been translated into Korean and published in this really cool zine they sent me. It's really, I think, hooked people because of exactly your question, Wallace. Like, what is marketing without social media? Well, Frankly, it wasn't even that hard to come up with a hundred things <laughs> right. that it could be. I did that like in an afternoon. Yeah. And on that list is everything from like start a newsletter list to like mm. pay for a billboard to like call a Put friend. Up pasties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gorilla marketing. Put up pasties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bumper stickers, like put a sign in your yard, like Mm -hmm. all of these sorts of, you know, some of them are very, I think, kind of throwback mark, like to how people used to market before the Internet. Mm -hmm. And then some of them were much more like, um, you know, I was doing this in the a moment when like clubhouse was like blowing up. So I was like, you know, join these sorts of online conversational spaces. That's like not on social. That's not Instagram. That's not social media in the same way or like and a lot of it, honestly, was just also direct sales, like email yeah. 10 people, you know, and tell them how they can buy something from you. People forget about that. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's how you just have to like, I think being cringe is very popular right now. That's like one of the most cringe things to do, right? Is like to ask people to buy your thing and put yourself up to be rejected <laughs> like to your face because that's really hard. But that's just, that's how you do a business. That's it. I I feel like you've really taught me well, Michelle, that the rejection never hurts as much as like almost the not asking. Like if you don't get over the hurdle of the feeling or the fear of not being able to be direct with people, it never hurts. Your business also won't work. Like yeah. it's just all these people that we're like we see and we aspire to be who have these giant online platforms mm-hmm. like most likely they've had to do some of that really cringe direct selling of themselves and we just don't see it anymore because now we see them pitch to this huge audience and it never feels that way. But, you know, really what I've come around to, and this is like a harsh take, most of us, I think when we are promoting our business on social media, we're just scared of actually selling to individual people. And we use social media as a cop out because it's way easier to put up a post and then complain that the algorithm didn't show it to anybody and it only got 10 likes and nobody bought my thing mm-hmm. than it is to actually in like reach out to people and ask them to buy your thing. And that sucks. I hate it. I try to avoid <laughs> asking people to buy my things for a long time. <laughs> I get it. I'm not here judging anyone who's listening or who just like turned this off and was like, fuck you, Amelia. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I just, I think it's, it, it's, it's what ends up happening and I see it constantly. And I will say, I think there are certain businesses that thrive on social media. And I think that I'm speaking mostly to my fellow service providers. I think a lot of product stuff, like that's a totally different ball game. You're like, you know, 
you're trying to go on Shark Tank. You're trying to make the next scrub daddy. Like that's a, <laughs> you're probably not sending one on one emails asking people to buy your scrub daddy. But like, you know, you're selling podcast services, you're selling copywriting, you're selling whatever. Like social media is not where it's at. Like relationship marketing is where it's at. Well, especially mm. if you are a service provider, to your point, you have limited time, right? You can only take on so many podcasts that you can add it. I could only write for so many people as a copywriter. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily want to achieve scale. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want to have a wait list for the next four years for my copywriting services. No one's going to sign up for that. That What's the point other than like maybe a vanity metric or making me feel popular and important? Mm-hmm. That's not actually that useful. So to your point, you don't necessarily need social. But I am curious. You went dark, right? On social media. <laughs> why? Yeah. Why the extreme? Like the black sort of the. the why? Because I I think a lot of people, when they come to the realization that you did, that like, wait, I'm not going to be a mega influencer. I'm not going to get a million followers. Um, This isn't going to be the way that I like make my money um, Mm -hmm. or run my business. They take it personally and they're like, well, it's because I didn't get it. Mm. Not your perspective, which I think is correct, which is like, no, the the game was never stacked in my favor. Yeah. And they kind of like just shut down on social and maybe share a little less and like don't try as hard and maybe lurk a little bit more. And Mm -hmm. every now and then we'll like throw something up there. They're still using social media, just not as like intensely as they used to with the fervor that they, you know, when they were trying to accumulate followers. So is it, was it a personal thing? Like you needed to go cold Turkey in order to maybe, I don't know, get out of it altogether. Or what was the reason? What was the reason? So it was actually a values alignment issue for me. So I think the piece, the way I've told the story so far is really like my personal journey that I went on. But the other thing that started happening around when I left social media was just a lot more news coverage around how Instagram and TikTok track us on our phones, how they monitor our spending behaviors and our viewing behaviors, and then how they use our viewing behaviors to coerce us into buying things. Mm -hmm. And You know, I was working so hard in other areas of my life to really, like, liberate myself from that level of coercion and Mm. oppressive systems. And and I was just like, I am not here for this. Like, I I think living and acting in alignment with my values is really important to me. And I just saw this real lack of integrity and how these platforms are operating and what they're selling us and how how our own behavior happens on them. And so I decided to step away for that reason. And the secret is (laughs) I like still have a thin stud will like occasionally post a picture of my dog for like my six friends. Like, it, you know, it's still there, but I think at the time, like what really got me to leave was just the values piece of, I was like, I cannot say I'm about all the things that I'm about and still be here anymore. Like it just mm. won't, it won't work for me. It's not going to do it. I want to be more true to myself, I guess, is like cliche as that sounds. No, but it becomes exhausting to your point when you're out of alignment with your values. Then like that is the surefire path to burnout like very quickly. We're taking a quick pause to talk about Open, one of our sponsors. Open is a mindfulness app built to transform your life and Boy, oh boy, can I just say Open has made the last eight months of my life a lot easier (laughs) because I've been pregnant and uh, definitely not going to yoga class, definitely not going to Pilates, definitely not going to any meditation classes just because I have I've been really sick for most of my pregnancy and then very swollen Shrek feet, SpongeBob feet. It's just not a cute look. And being able to exercise from home at my own pace and my own timing on the Open app has been a godsend. And when I don't want to exercise, when I'm having a spiral panic attack about the fact that I'm bringing a human onto this planet in 2020, I can just turn on a meditation and bring myself back to center. It is chef's kiss amazing. I use Open to fall asleep. I use Open to do many breathwork sessions. And I also love their Pilates. They have the best music curation. They have really amazing guides. We can't say enough positive things about them. And you get to try them free for 30 days, which is an amazing deal because it's such a premium subscription. And it's just a beautiful experience through and through. So we will link your 30 days free in the show notes, or you can use code holisticism at open.com backslash holisticism. So don't miss out. Honestly, it couldn't hurt you to try even just... 
one little meditation session. It's about to be a little crazy time of year. You might benefit when you're like, I'm sick of my family. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, one month of open alone is less than the cost of a yoga class, a Pilates class or a meditation class. So it's definitely worth it. Or even like two matches. (laughs) <laughs> if you go to a coffee shop, they're like eight fifty now. <laughs> yeah, you can either get a, a matcha with CBD oil in it yeah. once, or you can you can open every single day of the every month. Every day, honestly, go sign up with open dot com backslash listicism. One of the things I feel like we hear a lot and is very. I feel like prescient in this conversation is the conversation around being canceled Mm -hmm. and that people will say, well, I feel like I need to market on Instagram. I really want to, and you know, want to be online and show up as this person. Let's maybe not just say Instagram online. Um, but I'm afraid of being canceled. And while we're talking, I'm kind of thinking, is that really it? Like, is that really, I'm sure some people are, but is that really the fear that we mostly have? And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, just with your experience, like both personally, but even with business owners. Yeah. I mean, I think it often when people say that it's just like a deeper fear of visibility in general. Like mm. I have a lot of thoughts separately on cancel culture that are yeah. maybe less about like our, in, whether it's our actual fear. You know, I really love like Adrian Marie Brown's book, like we will not cancel us. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great resource to go to, to like think about cancel culture in general. And if you're someone who's like, yeah, I can't be online because I don't want to get canceled. Like, I would say go read that book (laughs) because what I normally I'm like, what do you think you're going to be canceled for? Like, what are you talking about or doing? And then what actually just ends up coming up is that fear of visibility and that fear of vulnerability. Like it's a fear of visibility to step out there and say, I'm doing my thing. But at the core of that is just like the inherent vulnerability of like offering something in the world. And that's so hard and scary. And frankly, most people never do it, which is why they don't become business owners or become creators or become artists, because it's so scary Mm -hmm. (laughs) to offer something to the world because Mm -hmm. the world can turn it down or the world cannot care or the world can say no or the world can, I mean, can cancel you. Sure. But like, Mm -hmm. I think normally we're more afraid of the rejection or I think no one caring. And giving up control. I think Mm -hmm. is what that is, right? Like Mm -hmm. we can pretend like we're in control by withholding, you know, from the Mm -hmm. world, Totally. but we never are. (laughs) Like that's the lesson of life is like, we're not, we're not controlling this stuff. Like we can orient ourselves on a path, but we have no idea how that path is going to turn out. We just kind of have to be happily responding or like responding in general to the world around us and, um, and trying to figure it out on our path on, on the way. But that's horrifying especially if you want to be seen as perfect or good or whatever it is you've been told you need to be like makes you want to throw up, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of why people will often prefer social media to those sorts of like direct conversation and sales techniques we've been talking about, because especially when we look at Instagram, I mean, that's a platform of controlling your own image Oh yeah, and it's a space where you can make like the perfect post. And Mm -hmm. I think that, Yes, by posting it, you open yourself up to it failing or it not being received, like you lose that control. However, what happens now is you can just blame that on the algorithm, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. so you can stay in this feedback loop where you're like, I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing them correctly. I'm really, I'm doing well. I'm good. I'm making the perfect things. And it's just the platform's fault that it's not going well. And while that is true, I do blame the platform. <laughs> but I'm with you. But there's a caveat here, which is that like, if you're not doing anything else or you're not putting your stuff anywhere else, you're like, you don't have a business. You have like a series of nice posts. Mm -hmm. We also can control immediately our relationship with other people. We can block someone when we don't like Mm. what they're saying about us or to us. We don't want to hear their feedback. We can mute them. That mute feature, I feel like says so much about (laughs) human psychology and people just being like, just mute them. And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) I don't Just avoid the uncomfortable interaction you don't want to have. (laughs) Which you can't avoid IRL unless you don't leave your house. Um. (laughs) (laughs) Which during the pandemic, we all didn't leave our houses. And I think like our ability to tolerate that discomfort has gone down as a result. Like 100%. You know, and that's not anyone's fault per se. It's just like 
I think it pushed us even deeper into these spaces where we we wanted that control even more because we lacked it, you know, throughout so many other areas of our lives during the past few years. And so, but I think like where I come to all of this from is still that like, I want all of the people I see trying to start businesses. I want them to succeed. I want them Mm -hmm. to have successful businesses on their own terms, whether that means like a side hustle or it means like we're going to replace your full time income with a business with your own work. Mm -hmm. I just think social media is rarely the way that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's often the first place we go, right? Like you want to start a business, you claim your handle, you start making content. And I see a lot of people who just have made a lot of content and never got around to actually starting the business because Mm -hmm. they went to Instagram first instead of, you know, for me, it's like, go to your notion doc or go to your piece, your notebook and like, figure out the offerings. Like it's a business. What's for sale? Build your community, build your network, build that sense of trust with you so that when you put these things that are for sale on sale, people want them from you. And I think that's what works. You know, like I said, before, I used the word phrase before, like relationship marketing. It's like that type of network building and genuine like offering to people what you have to offer and directly <laughs> offering it to them. Like, I think it works. There are a lot of businesses out there that show that, including my own. So, you know, the next stage of the journey for me after going dark on social media, I left my personal platforms up. I wanted the archive of me to exist. But then I launched my business with like a website and I sent like 60 personal emails to people. And I did that in September of 2021. And then last year, so 20. 22 was my first full year in business. And, you know, I, as a one person business, like grew that to, we did just over 90 K in revenue last year. So like it's working. (laughs) Yeah. I like to share real numbers. (laughs) I think no one says like how much money they make, but when I'm saying this, I'm like, I made more money myself last year than I'd ever been paid from a job before that. So that's such an amazing feeling. Incredible. It feels, it was so hard. I'm not going to, it was so hard, but it feels so good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that's the other thing, too. I I feel like there's this last thing about the lie that is social media that is sold, but it's like this dangling carrot that it should be so easy to just launch something online that keeps people on there for so long trying to launch something before, to your point, they get to the fundamentals. And I think the idea that things should, this is slight a slight side tangent, but that things should be easy all the time also is something that I feel like somehow social media really seems to perpetuate very quickly with those get rich kind of post schemes that are happening as we talked about in that same episode with Caitlin. And I think it kind of just perpetuates this side of, I guess, capitalism, the American dream of the get rich quick dream that is not the case. I would agree with that. I think it absolutely does. Like the promise of virality is yes. the promise of becoming a millionaire just wrapped up in a different box, <laughs> like yeah. wrapped up in, in our little, in our phone boxes instead of, you know, the gold mines, right? Like it's just the same promise and the same dream and the same trap that like the few people that do make it big and get rich, like entice more and more of us to keep trying and going for it and just continuing to pour all of our energy into those areas. And I also agree with your point, Wallace, like we do get sold this idea that it, it can be easy or it should even should be easy for us. Like, why are you trying so hard? Like the cringe moment is a lot about like, it's all wrapped up in like, oh, it's so cringe to try hard. It's also wrapped up in that thing that Kate pointed out of like, You can no longer just post a TikTok and pretend you don't care if it goes viral. Like that's not an option anymore. So like we now we need cringe because it's like it's too it's too transparent. Like we we all see it. There's no making TikToks without like everyone being like, yeah, you hope this will hit. (laughs) And it it didn't. So like it, it, we were really wrapped up in that and that sense of ease. But I think it's just we're focusing it in the wrong direction. Like the things that should be easy are like being yourself, <laughs> like mm-hmm. getting to getting to express your reality in the world, getting to and like that stuff is so hard because of the world we live in. The mm-hmm. stuff that probably should be hard is like building a business that employs people and like does all these cool things like that's hard. Even like making your art, that's hard sometimes <laughs> like yeah. these really yeah. worthwhile things we're doing 
it's okay that they're hard, Mm -hmm. but it's just like the world around us makes the stuff that I think can and should be easier. Just like loving ourselves, loving each other. The world makes that so hard that we're like just blaming ourselves when things aren't easy because we can't call out the systems that make the stuff that should be easy really hard. (sighs) That was the tweetable moment. Yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> let me just <laughs> inhale that. <laughs> okay, I kind of have a twofold question. Do you feel like you have a strong boundary on like new social media platforms or is it kind of like a assess as things move? I feel like I have a pretty strong boundary around just like online surveillance. Like I have a pretty strong boundary around like, is this free for me because my behavior is being tracked and sold and I'm being like coerced to buy things as a result. So (laughs) that's kind of where my boundary is. Like to the extent that like, I don't even use Google services in my business. Bring back Bing. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I mean, Windows just invested so much money in chat GPT and like the open AI stuff to try to make Bing better. So it could happen for you, Wallace. I think guys, let's make Bing happen. (laughs) Another evil, like massive tech corporation. Yeah, we're like, like mm, Apple. Yeah, yeah. But I also think to exactly that point, like I'm not a luddite. I'm not like a true truther. Like I'm not exiting systems. Like my podcast is called Off the Grid, but that's tongue in cheek. Like I'm not going off the societal grid. Right. <laughs> but I really do. Again, to that point, like I do try to live out my values. So I live in like a no Amazon household. Like we don't use Amazon. We don't buy stuff on Amazon. I don't have G Suite for my business. I don't know. Like I don't use Google Calendar. But again, it's like so I use iCal. Like is Apple that much better? Probably. Like they're just different. Like Apple is maybe exploiting our mineral mineral resources, and Google is exploiting our attention resources. <laughs> like I'm not an idealist, and I don't think there are perfect solutions. I'm just really invested in helping people see that you don't have to do these things you have to do. My, I believe my actions are symbolic and that I, by sharing them, I can help people see that other options are open to them. So I think I'm pretty off social media in general because I think the model of social media apps is there no matter what app you're on. But does that mean I like de facto write them all off? No, not necessarily. Like I still like to be online. I'm still interested in what my friends are doing. I'm still yeah. like, I'm definitely the person where like my friends text me the TikToks and I try, like I go watch them and I like respond because <laughs> like I want to engage with the the humans in my life. I'm just never going to have a TikTok app on my phone. Well, you need a burner phone. You need a burner <laughs> phone so you can watch Yeah, it, right? You know? That's for me, if I'm going there, I have like a deeper problem. I, need to <laughs> I have my phone that's like, this is where TikTok and yeah. Amazon and Google and Instagram. Like your shadow side phone. Yeah, it's yeah. like your evil villain phone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have like Shein on there too. Oh, like everything bad. You just like, it's that's what's worst. happening. Uber. Honestly, great product idea. The evil phone. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Into it. Later. <laughs> it's definitely also like a flip phone and it's like matte black and it's like yeah it's, do this. it's like the razor do you remember those yeah. oh, oh those yeah. were so i wanted one of those don't so make bad, razors but. evil guys they're <laughs> kind of cool <laughs> i'm so curious how do you keep up with your friends like mm. do you feel like this has improved your relationship with your friends yes and no so i like really made it hard for myself because I did like a one, two punch of like, I'm going to leave Instagram and then I'm going to move from Chicago to Nebraska. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Yeah. Like truly like I'm just going to exit everything signing off. Yeah, no. So that was definitely like a challenge. I think I like digitally isolated and then geographically isolated myself. This was also all in 2020. So it's all during the pandemic. Like that's a lot. So I, it all got like wrapped up together for me. So how do I keep in touch with my friends now? Like I definitely text people, but I'm not a chronic texter. Like I'll text you back in a couple of days. I don't feel any pro- like same dude. And people <laughs> like, don't like it. The people do not like it all the time. Some people really don't like it. Yeah, they really don't. And also like I'm a big fan of a phone call. Yes, I'm going to miss your call three times, but I will always call back and we will eventually <laughs> talk like and it might only happen twice a year. And that's cool. Like I think what's. What's really happened is that I've just really expanded my sense of like what friendship can be and mean. And I used to have what I now see as like a kind of more adolescent idea that friends had to talk all the time. And I think Mm -hmm. that like as you get older and like your lives change and your geography changes and 
also you get to know yourself and you learn that like some of you do want to text all the time and some of you don't like you just have to be more flexible. And luckily for me, a lot of my friendships have survived that. And I think it was actually helpful. Like when I left Instagram, there were some people who like we just had a very clear like, how are we going to keep in touch without this? And then we yeah. figured out what worked for us. Some of them are text friends. Some of them are phone call friends. Some of them are I will come see you twice, once a year, twice. I'm not seeing anybody twice a year. I'll come see you once a year. friends. <laughs> <laughs> I feel really lucky that I've cultivated a lot of friendships where we can be honest with each other and where we all like live in a certain integrity of like, you're responsible for your own self-knowledge and you're responsible for communicating your needs. And with my, I would say with my friends, like none of us are out here like passive aggressively doing anything. I always joke that like I, you can't passive aggressive me. Like you can do it at me, but I won't, I don't take it up. I'm like, you don't engage. (laughs) I'm like, man. (laughs) So I'd say like each friendship is different and each friendship, like we as friends give the friendship what it needs. And most of my parasocial relationships fell away on Instagram. Like a lot of those people I'm not close with anymore. And sometimes I really miss that. Like sometimes I really like have a whole shelf of books I want to give away. And I really love just like putting them on Instagram and sending them to people who like I went to high school with who I haven't talked to in six years. Like that kind of stuff. That is like the magic of Instagram to me that like doesn't exist if you're not there. That's what I miss. I miss like you know, we always joke that like, you don't need to follow that person from high school that you never talked to. But like, sometimes you do. Sometimes yeah. it's so nice to know they had a baby. Sometimes it's so nice to know that they got this cool job. Mm-hmm. I've really been learning that like people all circle back also, like yeah. somebody you haven't talked to, like they return. So yeah. life is so long and they do return. And okay. you don't yeah. know that when you're younger. Or I didn't know that when I was younger. No, I was like, it's like, you're here, you're gone forever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly. true. So I think that's been another big lesson I've learned about friendship. You just have to get really clear with what you need and what you can offer and be really honest with people about that and then create a lot of space for things to flex as people's lives change and and not take it personally when somebody doesn't talk to you for a year and you find out a year later that like they lost a parent and a pet and like a job all at the same time. And of course, they didn't talk, they didn't respond to your text for nine months and being okay with that because you're okay Okay. enough like in yourself and your own value. Or are they just like, we're depressed. Yeah, <laughs> or, just, you, know. you don't have to go through like catastrophe. They just like weren't <laughs> feeling it. They were just like, yeah, too busy watching <laughs> below deck. <laughs> like, <laughs> also viable. <laughs> we love to say sometimes it ain't that deep. And I think my dad always says, <laughs> and I laugh at this, but so often he's like, it's really not that personal. Like most of what you think is personal is not. It's really not. And so I just was listening to on this note, um, Elizabeth Gilbert was just on Ah. Martha Beck's podcast recently Mm. and talked about this exact thing of like coming out of the pandemic, like their phones like blowing up with people wanting to like connect, connect, connect and like always trying to like make a plan, always trying to do the thing. And Elizabeth Gilbert was just like, I just had to tell these people to back off and like it wasn't going to happen with me. And basically she was like, <laughs> I have like six, three friends now. Yeah. <laughs> just like, like that's all I have capacity for and I don't really want them anymore. And I find that really inspirational. Just like really being like, this is who I am. This is what I've got to offer. And I know it's really valuable and I know other people need more from their friends and that's okay. I think that's such a cool way to think about there's so many things the pandemic has done to like refocus what's important in our lives. And very much so, I feel like you hear that about friendship from a lot of people in terms of just bringing to the center what is the most valuable and what you care about and what you want to prioritize. And that might mean no new friends or bye bye some of your current friends, not in like a harsh way, but Mm -hmm. do you feel like the almost the inverse of Michelle's question that you've had that with social media where you're like, oh, wow, I was engaged in these behaviors that I thought I liked and I thought I was into and I really believed and maybe they did serve me at that time. But looking back on it now, I really feel so at peace without them. So what comes to mind first is less the behavior and more like When I left social media, I never ordered another pair of girlfriend collective (laughs) leggings again. (laughs) That's not entirely true. I I definitely have ordered some sweatpants from them much more recently. But like, great point. It's like a lot of a lot of the objects I thought I desired, I did not desire. I desired like Mm -hmm. the status symbol of posting in those clothes. Like, 
I used to do some brand work with like parade underwear and I really thought I liked them. And let me tell you, I have not worn any of them since I stopped. They were not actually what I genuinely felt comfortable in. Literally, it's just like comfort. Yeah. And I think that like for me, it was less behaving in ways I realized weren't true to me. But it was deeper than that. Like my desires were being shaped by mm-hmm. these platforms. What I wanted was being influenced. And that is like to me, the root of all evil, like that, that's what these capitalist white supremacist patriarchal systems we live in are always trying to do. They're trying to get us to desire different things and believe those are our desires. Yeah. And that's really where I was like, Oh no, this is not good. And it happens like for me with, with things, but like with careers, mm-hmm. with human beings. Yeah. I think when you were also just to keep referencing this conversation with Kate, like I spent five hours listening to it yesterday, so I'm really familiar with it, but (laughs) it's very fresh. um, She was like, very fresh. I really enjoyed it. But she was like, do any of us actually desire the guy from the 1975? No, but like it's pernicious. It really does. It gets us. So I I think that that's what's really shifted for me. Like that's where I was like, oh, now I can actually start to get in touch with what I actually desire. Yes. Because I'm not so influenced. It's like compulsory heterosexuality, right? right. Where you're just yes. that's because everyone's sort of like pushing it on you all the time that like this is cool and this is what you should want. You're like, I guess I really want big bud brand yeah. overall. <laughs> yeah. Like I guess I that's need what them. I really, 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 really want. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't actually want those things. I feel like Especially with the image of the nuclear family as well, or or just kids, maybe um, like the image of that on social media and what that means and how that affects how people think they need to live their lives and what they want versus maybe connecting to that true desire. Whole other rabbit hole. Yeah, it's so true. And I think that like just the note, maybe I'll end this on is like leaving social media helped me get a lot of clarity in my personal life and my my desires and my friendships and like what I need and in that sphere of my life. And that honestly allowed me to be way more strategic in my professional life and to make choices that were a more aligned with my values, but b just actually aligned with my capacity and how much energy I have and aligned with like my special skills, like the things I'm really good at, like I'm really good at podcasting. And so I have multiple podcasts for my business. Like I have the time and energy for that. And just similarly to what we were just saying, like when I left social media, my personal network, like my personal friendships kind of shrank and solidified. But now my professional network I have very like strategically grown it and it's way bigger than it used to be. And that's where now my parasocial relationships live. They live in this like beautiful ecosystem of people that I make podcasts for who recommend me to other people who invite me to do things like because I'm not so busy doing that, just like on my Instagram, I'm doing it in a way that's like really working for my business Mm. and that is supporting me financially and supporting me creatively. And then in my personal life, I have other creative projects that never see the light of day because they can just be personal. And so I think the other thing that's happened is like leaving social media has helped me just like see the different areas of my life as different. I don't feel like everything is so muddled in the same space. And then once I can do that, then I can actually integrate them in more meaningful and beautiful ways instead of just constantly being confused about like, is this for me? Is this for the internet? Is this for Instagram? Should I share this? Am I going to get canceled? Is it going to be too much? Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) I'm not doing that anymore. I'm like the bounds of everything are so much clearer and contained. And, Mm. and with that, like that clarity to me is everything like that's that sort of clarity. I think it's probably one of the clearest seeds of the success that I've been able to find in softer sounds and in off the grid and in these more like work things that I've been doing and sharing. Mm. I love that. At the start of the year, I joined a, a group, accountability group for meditation for morning practice. And the, the mantra is keep it clear. Mm. And that's just like that's what the name of the group on WhatsApp. It's not on okay. social media. That's what we do. If we do it on WhatsApp, it's, such a beautiful reminder to come back to like, okay, keep it clear. What do I need to do to keep it clear? And it is so obvious. And I feel like that's, that's exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Like you, you just have to come back to that. Like what's your work? Mm. 
because your work, capital W work, is the work that you do every day, right? Like that leads you to your work. So how can you stay as clear as possible so that you can do your capital W work? I agree with that so much. Yeah. The work you do every day is your capital W work. So if you're looking around and all you do every day is social media, but social media is not your capital <laughs> W work, there's a real misalignment. <laughs> it is working on you. Yes, it is working on you. Agreed. <laughs> Oh, Amelia, I have so many more questions. So we got to have a part two. I'm just saying. (laughs) Gladly. Normally, people really want to know more specifics. Like, I like jamming with you two on, like, the philosophy of it all. But, like, Mm -hmm. if you want to know, like, what's my five-step plan for leaving social media, it's on Off the Grid Podcast. Go listen. Perfect. Okay, yes. Please tell all of the wonderful listeners, how they can connect with you, all, all the many things that you're doing. Yeah. So you can find me at softersounds.studio on the internet. Put it in your bing.com. <laughs> yeah, put it in bing.com, <laughs> Softer Sounds Studio. <laughs> but that's where you'll find all of Softer Sounds podcast offerings. It's also the home of my podcast, Off the Grid, which is about leaving social media without losing all your clients. So it's for folks who want to leave socials, but also want to run a successful business. It's also for people who want to launch a business without social media. The first like five episodes of that are really just a mini course in how to do all of this. I've got a free leaving social media toolkit that goes along with those episodes. So you can find that at softersounds.studio slash by IG, B-Y-E-I-G. And that's kind of the best ways to find me. Like there's, I have a podcast about podcasting called The Softer Cast. I have a baby personal project that's a tarot podcast called My Tiny Tarot Practice. Really just like go to Softer Sound Soft Studio and and explore. There's lots there to find. I love that you have more podcasts than us. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me feel good. Oh my Michelle's gosh. Michelle's immediately slightly competitive. She's like, no, 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 no. It, it's making me feel I'm good. I'm I'm feeling better. <laughs> yeah. It's really, you know. Anything can be a podcast if you believe in yourself. If you'll say it out loud. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> but guys, it's a lot of work. I oh my gosh. <laughs> It's a lot of you, you could literally could not do it without Amelia. <laughs> there would be none. <laughs> oh, the other thing I didn't mention is I taught a whole class on this in the Liminal Library. So go yeah, get yeah. into the Liminal Library and take my class because you can learn it all there and stay in the beautiful Holisticism community. Bang, bang, boom, baby. We'll, we'll put the link. We'll do all the links. Amelia, this was so wonderful. Thank you for sharing your genius that is you know, can't be contained in this one pod as exemplified by your universe that you've created. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you both. It's been a blast.